If you're an artist or creative, interested or curious about what goes on in the world of business and tech, or you're a tech entrepreneur who's interested in being close with fashion designers or musicians, then this show is for you because it's conversations with the coolest people making it happen at the forefront of technology, culture, business, and the arts. Welcome back, everybody. We are here today at another episode of The Intersection at the Intersection of Technology and Culture, interviewing the coolest people making it happen at the forefront of tech, culture, business, and the arts, creating common ground and camaraderie between industries, disciplines, and circles of talent that normally wouldn't be together. Um, I am very happy here to welcome today Zehra, who is the head of Founders Community at Republic. She's a VC at Gold House, where they champion and invest in Asian Pacific creators. She's an angel investor. She runs Z List, where she like sends out these curated lists of events and tech and business and New York uh, and other places too, I think. And Zehra is a Gen Z, just like me, and I really enjoy exchanging ideas with other young people. So um, welcome. Yeah, I mean, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to chat all things about the intersection of literally everything that you said, but particularly, of course, fundraising, founders, um, and VC. Yeah, so um, venture capital is interesting to me. You have all these uh, unconventional takes on it, so to speak. Um, can you walk me through your thoughts on VC? A lot of people thinking is this best form of uh, startup funding and debt is the worst. And um, if you're not a unicorn, then you suck. And like, uh, what, what's your what's your take on like the appropriate application of VC and where uh, the shortcomings might be in the way that that we talk about it, but also like where the possibility is in venture capital that people may may overlook, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I think um, part of my unconventional, I guess, like takes on venture capital and the fundraising ecosystem are rooted in the fact that I had founded a company that was, let's say, like not VC backable, but it was successful, scaled it to profitability. And it was an e-commerce business, like really, really simple. And even now, and when I'm explaining it, I go like, oh, it's not VC backable. It's not this, it's not that, because our ecosystem is so hyper fixated on things that are VC backable and those just being the best companies. There's so many memes that say like, Here's one company that's profitable and it was bootstrapped. Here's a company that raised like a huge VC round and has no paying customers. And it's like this person has a bunch of mics versus like the <laughs> profitable founder has none. Uh, and so I think like those conversations and that just like ecosystem has been built up over time with VCs, particularly when we see the media really like grabbing on to one founder and calling them like the future or the next Mark Zuckerberg. Like I think that PR element really dives into just like VC. I think Mark Andreessen actually said that like Andreessen Horowitz is a media company that makes its money through VC. So I think that media component with VC is mm. such a huge part of why people put it on a pedestal. But the reality is there's so many different ways that you can finance a business, whether that is with something like Republic through equity crowdfunding, or if it is debt financing, or if it's like applying for a bunch of different grants and winning these equity free grants, going through an accelerator. And I think that our ecosystem puts them on like a scale of what's cool and what's not cool. And that's kind of what I try to fight against because I want to work with founders that are incredible CPG founders that scale and exit their companies just the same amount that I want to work with consumer tech founders who get backed by some of the best VCs in the world. Like to me, those are all incredible founders building highly relevant things. So I think that my takes on the ecosystem are kind of rooted in the fact that I've had this experience in the like non-VC, just entrepreneur ecosystem. And it's funny, I feel like a lot of people use the word entrepreneur when it comes to businesses that are not VC backable, but then they'll say founder for things that are VC backable. And I'm like, even just the language, I'm sure you could do, I'm sure someone could do like the etymology behind these words and how they became associated mm -hmm. with certain types of businesses. But I mean, all of this to say that, yeah, my takes are that there are all types of financing make sense for different business models. There's no hierarchy. If you can bootstrap and not raise any money and not take any debt, that's obviously the best thing to do in the world. Raising VC mm. isn't always like, raising VC isn't always like the signal that you're going to be successful. For the most mm -hmm, part, it's mm -hmm. actually like most of the companies fail. So I think people just should stop aspiring to it. 
in the sense that it's not something you have to do, it's not a signal, it's really just about choosing the financing that makes the most sense for your business model and for your company. Mm-hmm. Well, for a lot of people, it is. like There's so mm-hmm. much attention around, oh, we just raised, we're off to the races, here we go, woo! But like um, uh, that, that aside, you got into VC, so I want to hear more about your style, uh, what the promises that you saw getting into the space, uh, what do you think is cool about it, and what's the, like, the approach that you try to take? Yeah, so when I kind of got into the VC ecosystem, I'll take it like a few steps back. So I started that company. I uh, That was in Hong Kong where I grew up, and then I moved to... Oh, wow. You grew up in Hong Kong? Mm-hmm. Oh, I think I did see that somewhere. Oh, I want to get to that later, but sorry, keep going. Yeah, no, no worries. Um, but I founded that in Hong Kong, came to New York to go to Columbia for undergrad. And I think part of my interest in like entrepreneurship and founders and startups was having run my own business. So when I came to undergrad, like, yes, I was on campus doing things and I was recruiting for like consulting and investment banking, but every single semester I was working at a startup. So I worked at 14 startups throughout the entirety of undergrad. Um, the shortest project was like three months, which is like a quarter. And then the longest time I worked at a startup was two years, a few months. So it varied a lot in terms of what I was doing, but I was just wanting to learn like everything, how they decide what marketing to do, growth, LTV to CAC, like how do they assess that? How do they figure out what the next um, fundraise is going to look like and when it's going to happen? And so all of these companies were completely different industries, like consumer social, climate, fintech, like across the board. And they were from stages like pre-seed to series B. And so I think what kind of was the commonality amongst all those companies was the fact that no matter how much money they had raised, they were always stressed about the next fundraise. And so I kind of figured like, okay, I've learned a lot about how you actually run a business in completely different business models, but I don't know who these people are that everyone is like so nervous to like get their money. Like how did they make their decisions? And so Mm. the reason I decided to work at Republic full time was because it was this very unique opportunity where I got to speak to founders and I also got to speak with VCs and very few Mm. people are typically getting to speak with both. It's normally Mm -hmm, like you're a founder mm -hmm. talking to VCs or you're a VC Mm -hmm. talking to founders. And so slowly... Your founders are talking to founders and VCs talking to VCs. Yeah, that too. And so it's almost like there was not... This was just too unique of an opportunity for me to not pursue because I really just wanted to explore both... Um, what both of those ecosystems look like. And so that was kind of my foray into VC in the beginning, more as like an operator at a startup who was working with founders. And naturally, whenever you work with founders, VCs want to talk to you because that's kind of everything they do. They want to learn about the next founders, who's going to be the next big thing. (laughs) Um, And so a lot of that work started at Republic. And then, like you mentioned, I was at Gold House um, and Gold House has a ventures arm. So then I started to kind of dive more deeply into like sending things to the investors investment committee and doing diligence and kind of what more of the traditional VCs do. I loved what I did with Gold House because Gold House was or is a fund dedicated to investing in Asian co-founded businesses. So it was almost like rooted in a community element as well. And Gold Mm -hmm. House is huge on community. They also have an accelerator as well. So kind of all of those overlapping things provided me with a really unique perspective to kind of understand the way that VC works. And I also got to like see how Gold House would invest in like other companies that these other VCs had led the round in and Gold House maybe was a follow on check. So it was just really great for my development in in terms of getting into VC. And um, frankly, like if I had not had all of that startup work, I don't think I would ever have learned anything about VC. So I guess I have a kind of like non-traditional background in the sense because I didn't go down the investment banking route and then pivoting into VC. It was more like... Is that what a lot of people do? A lot of people do do that. Um, They'll either like do investment banking, then they'll go into private equity or venture capital. Um, And there are a lot of founders who obviously exit their company and then they found a VC, but... I like those ones more. Yeah. (laughs) I feel like they have obviously like the experience and the perspective, but that was kind of my motivation in terms of like pivoting into VC. And um, this is actually like, I haven't announced this yet, but it's confirmed. Um, I exclusive. (laughs) I just recently started out as a scout for Headline Ventures. So I'm working with their team. Mm. They have a $400 million consumer fund for early stage investments. And so I'm working with their team as well to like, 
send founders their way. I get to like sit in on diligence calls, help them with community. Cool. And so I'm just really excited to continue to be involved in the ecosystem. But I will say at the end of the day, like my priority is helping founders. So the reason I do all of this VC stuff is to help founders. That's like mm-hmm. really my 100% my only motive in everything at this point is to make the founders' lives easier. Yeah, I was going to say, it sounds like you're a big champion of founders. And then maybe you got into VC because there's so much variety in the types of businesses you could be involved with, but also to be able to look at them from this holistic view and see how you can just learn in general how uh, startups and and businesses work and get so much of a a wide breadth of experience that you can just jump into any venture and be like, all right, let's help you guys. Boom, boom, boom. Um, Hmm, cool. Uh, So you grew up in Hong Kong. What was that like? Yeah, I mean, it was really great. It was very formative. Hong Kong is such a unique city. I um, was growing up there practically practically right after it was handed over from the British back to China. But Hong Kong oh, wow. does have 50 years of autonomous rule. So that's till 2047. And then we officially go back to China. So, no, I mean, Hong Kong is one wow. of the best places in the world. It's such a compact mm, city I mean, that has both negative and positives to it. But it was great to be able to, like, be close to the beach and be, like, in the forest. And then Hong Kong is great because... If if you get on like Hong Kong's version of the subway, the MTR, or if you drive, in five minutes you can be like in the thick of the city with like huge skyscrapers everywhere. So, I mean, having lived in New York now, it's great because the city is so huge. But I loved in Hong Kong that you could like have this peaceful environment and then just like go to the city. But then five minutes later, you could just drive through this one mountain and then you're back in like the peaceful area. So I think that that separation was really great. But I think that the only city that's like Hong Kong is New York. Maybe I would throw Paris in there, but I truly think that like it's one of the most unique cities in the world, and I'm really grateful that I grew up there. How did that happen? Like, was there a situation with your family or? Yeah, yeah. My parents um, are from Pakistan, and then work brought them to Hong Kong, and I was born in Singapore, so we were very much always in that area. Interesting, interesting. Uh, so, like, if you had to go and work out of if someone told you tomorrow you have to like stay in one country for the next five years and do your work uh, you have to like reestablish yourself in like the local community where would you go do, i can't say new york or does it have to be somewhere other than new york? <laughs> yeah it has to be somewhere else okay hmm i mean this is like i don't think this is a surprising answer but i do feel like actually i have two answers now so i'm trying to choose between them Actually, okay, I'm going to adjust my answer from what I was going to say. I would actually choose London just because I'm starting Mm. to meet a lot of folks from London who are coming to New York to like expand the businesses that they set up in London. And I mean, I last time I went to London was like years ago, but I'm going soon again. And um, from everything I've heard, the ecosystem there is like booming, but people also have good like boundaries for self-development, which I feel like New York is a little go, 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 go. So part of me is like in the Mm. next five years, I'm going to be in my like later 20s. So sometimes some separation would be good but it also sounds like london has just like this inc- like crazy emerging tech ecosystem and also an incredible amount of stolen art and i'm a huge art historian but um, i would also love to be in a city where there are huge museums like that so that was kind of my the immediate thing i thought of because L- i was going to say la but i don't think la has nearly as many museums as like london so i changed mm-hmm. my answer because i do need my my kind of like outlet for looking at art and appreciating art and talking about it so change my answer to london hmm, interesting well going off of art i know that you have a art history degree and you've said quote i use my art history degree more than my finance degree in day-to-day startup vc life mm-hmm. so uh how yeah i think something <laughs> I, it's, it's such a crazy statement when i tell this to people but i think it's because like with my financial economics degree like of course i was able to learn these are the statements that you look at with a company and this is how you analyze them this is how like liabilities and assets work and that was great for foundational stuff but i think when you're in VC, everything you're doing is looking at history, looking at the past and trying to decide whether or not this founder is has like a new perspective on something or a new product or a new disruption that's actually going to lead to innovation. And with hmm. art history, especially when you're actually like an art historian and you're kind of creating your own opinions, you're looking at paintings that are like 400 years old, sometimes paintings or sculptures that are 2000 years old that have existed forever. People have written so many things about them and you read and consume all those opinions and then you come up with your own. And so learning how to do that and 
kind of like contextualizing the people's opinions who came before you, explaining your own opinion, being concise about it. Like that is kind of at the core of what art history is and the study of art history. And that's exactly what you do in VC. Like if I wanted to have an opinion about consumer social apps and what Instagram and Facebook did, but what the future of it looks like, that's the same as me like looking at a painting that was mm. painted 200 years ago and I read what people said 200 years ago, I read what people said 50 years ago, 100 years ago, one year ago, and I understand that whole picture and then I come up with my own like opinion on it. So that's kind of the way that I think art history, my art history degree has really, really primed me to be in this ecosystem. What do you think the balance is between analyzing history and having a really deep intimate knowledge of how things have played out before but not letting that like constrain your thinking of what's possible yeah in the future if that makes sense yeah it totally makes sense i think so if i'm going to use like an art historical example i there was um a painting that i published a paper about it at Yale and the whole painting had been studied like over and over again. It was a famous painting that Degas painting and it, it painted and it was called Young Woman with Ibis and it's hanging in the Met Museum. And obviously like Degas is a really famous impressionist painter, but people only know him for a few things. So when I looked at this painting, there were, there were opinions about it 200 years ago and people had like one pretty like regimented set of opinions, but people had kind of talked about like some of his other paintings that maybe involve a new quality that people just hadn't considered. And so instead of letting those influence me and thinking, okay, this painting like has only one interpretation, I just started to think about what have I read that existed around this time period that these people maybe didn't consider. And so I always think about it as like, Yes, these are people who wrote 200 years ago, but 200 years ago, like they didn't know that there were all of these like trends and architectural like symbolism happening in South Asia that might lead to why they got painted this. And so like part of me always thinks and positions questions as like what what did these people not know and what do I know because like information is more easily accessible that informs their opinion. So even if I'm agreeing with someone, I'll always find a way to like enhance their opinion by providing other evidence. If I'm just mm. providing a completely new perspective, I'll say like they didn't consider these things or like they didn't know that these things existed mm. that prove maybe why the painting mm. could be interpreted in this way. Mm. That's interesting. So you maybe find a founder who's had historically in their own life, you find patterns of a unique perspective or a secret that's been in plain sight for them. And you realize, wow, there's some kind of latent potential for this person that has been actualized or they haven't had the resources to do it. But because of your knowledge of history, you can come in and be like, hey, I'm going to support your way of thinking because do, 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 do. I know all of these examples from mm -hmm. the past. Yeah. And That's like exactly the way I would apply it with founders because I, and maybe this is very specific to me, but I love just like reading people's opinions on things. So even if it's not like published in a book or it's literally Twitter, like that's kind of the point. And I think the reason why Twitter is so popular in the VC ecosystem, because you read all of these other people's opinions and everyone's opinions are just built off of, built off of other opinions that they've mm. read. And so it's almost that compounding effect why I think our ecosystem mm. is so focused on using your voice, sharing your opinion and sharing why you think the way that you do. So I love to reference like everything that I did in art history, that's literally what I do in VC. That's what we all do in VC. And so that's my favorite thing to kind of surprise people with because the people are always shocked when I say that I do use the art history stuff more than the finance stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree uh, about the compounding effect of sharing thoughts and opinions via the internet. I can only imagine how 10 to 20 years from now, because of this giant global knowledge exchange how that will like influence innovation or improving the quality of people's lives i'm very optimistic about that um hmm, hmm. what else uh you so you do a lot of like events i want to hear more about your like uh, event history what you think makes a great event uh what events that you do that you're like most enthusiastic about and why mm -hmm. but but let's just start from like how you got into uh, curating it and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. So I, this really started, I think, from the fact that when I first started out or like came back to New York City when COVID was kind of 
dwindling down, I went to like a bunch of events. People were just hosting events everywhere for VCs, for founders, for everyone. So I just went to so many events. I would probably go to like two events a day. Like there was always a breakfast, a lunch, a dinner, just constantly going. And for the first full year, I can say confidently that I probably went to at like over a hundred events. And I think maybe like two of them were actually good and useful. <laughs> and I'm really not saying that to be dramatic. It's just true. It's just truly the reality of it because you would show up to the event and it sounded like really cool. But then the thing is there would be no like structure in terms of like meeting people or there would be no, like if it was a panel, mm -hmm. the panel would, the moderator would ask questions that you can Google. And I'm like, so why would we, right, right, why would right, we come right, here right. to get right. answers I to watch questions? This on YouTube. Literally. Yeah. I can watch this on YouTube. <laughs> I can read, I can read their Twitter. And so part of my motivation specifically with hosting these events was because I felt like I had wasted so much of my own time. Like I still lived really close to Columbia, which is very North in New York. And a lot of these events were like in Tribeca. So if I'm like taking like an hour to go up and down town and then just spend like an hour at this event or two hours, that's like four hours. And this is mm -hmm. after work as well. So that just started compounding to me. And my motivation to start hosting events was because I just didn't want to see them like this. I love panels. And so when I have someone speak on a panel, I will read like everything that they've posted on Twitter in the last like six months. I'll read mm -hmm. all the interviews they've done. I'll listen to the podcast when it's like a huge panel of five so I did people. For you. Oh yeah. See, that's perfect. I think that's why you're asking such specific <laughs> questions because I think moderation is so important because you really don't get like useful information unless the moderator is actually prepared. And so just even sometimes sitting on panels, I can tell when the moderator has not done their research and it just feels like a waste of everyone's time. So, <laughs> so I'm just being frank. And so part of my motivation to host these events was the fact that like I didn't want to waste anyone's time we live in a very hyper efficient city a lot of people live like in Brooklyn and in Jersey and like all over Manhattan and it takes forever sometimes to like go to an event so I want people to feel like they spent their time wisely and they spent it well and so my events are kind of I'd say there's three buckets there are the larger scale like let's say call them like social like networking events but i keep mine very professional like they're not parties by any means like there are a lot of new york city community builders who host parties networking parties yeah, yeah but mine are much more focused on like it's a social like there's music but the music is quiet you can still talk to people the lights mm -hmm. are on you um and i put a lot of effort into like identifying who's a founder who's an investor i will always make sure that i can make connections in those larger formats then i do panels like i said i like to keep them only 40 minutes and i make the questions really specific and then i do the really small curated events that are like 20 seed stage cpg founders with like an expert founder or like a VC who invests in them that will give them advice. So kind of like a panel format as well, but just a lot smaller and it's more of like a round table discussion. So I think all my events are just rooted in the emphasis that I don't want to waste people's time. And that's why with the Z list, I, um, in undergrad, a lot of people used to ask me when I was an upperclassman, there's like 50 events happening on campus, which are like the five events you think are going to be most useful to me so that I can like make sure I get the most out of them. So I've kind of been doing this since undergrad. So it's been a couple of years now where like people do come to me and say, which of these do you think are going to be the most helpful? And I'd gone through the experience painfully sometimes of wasting time at a lot of events. So with the Z list, my requirements are if your event is featured in my newsletter, I have to go to three events that you've hosted that I actually enjoy oh, that's myself so cool. at. Yeah, like I'm very particular, particular about it. Nice, nice. People can't pay you to be featured, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. It's only awesome. like, so three events that... Um, they've hosted that I actually like. And then I also just have to be aligned with like whoever, any of the partners, the speakers, like I have to be aligned with them and make sure that they haven't done anything that's, so that's cool. kind of like not in alignment with it. my brand. And then I always ask about what their um, breakdown looks like in terms of attendance because people will make comments at my events like, this event is so diverse. And I'm like, this event's not diverse. This is just New York City. <laughs> this is just what people actually in New York like look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is what the population looks like. This is what like, the population yeah. looks like. And this is not the events where it's like 90% percent men because if, if you go to an event and that's the case like you know you're not going to learn anything new because everyone's the same right 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 right, right so right. those are kind of my requirements and so i turn a lot of people away i say no especially people who i've gone to their events before i've even co-hosted with them and i didn't like co-hosting with them so i just say no and people kind of it sounds really harsh but i'm like I have 25,000 people on this newsletter who really respect and trust me and i'm not putting something that's going to waste their time whatsoever can you keep elaborating on what you were seeing at these other events that 
you felt like were a waste of time or shortcomings and how you've been trying to do those things differently? Mm -hmm. So I think like with the rise of Gen Z and post COVID, I think people were, people just missed being social. So there were a rise and maybe this is just like a VC industry specific thing, but I feel like there was a rise of like social, personal, professional events where it was like party formats, which is like all good and fun. But the thing is like, I see myself and the people in my community as professional people. So I never want to like blur lines. And I know a lot of community mm. builders who will sometimes like lead their events with like blurring lines with personal I've and professional. I've blurred a lot of lines. <laughs> it's not always worked out. Well, I think it's just, I think it's everyone's preferences and you just have to be straightforward with people because sometimes people will misrepresent events and it says like, this is going to be professional. It's going to be networking. And then you show up and it's like a dark room. There's like no air conditioning and it's just like clearly not a professional event. So my frustrations are always oh, that's like, that's no good. No air conditioning. Yeah. Like I'm always like, you need to kind of represent the situation to people exactly how it is. I also mm. know a lot of community builders who will um, get sponsors, but they won't give the sponsors like the, the attendee information specifically because the attendees are not founders or they're not VCs, even though they tell the sponsors they are. So I think a lot of community builders in New York are really like, <laughs> wait, what? Yeah. There's a lot of build community <laughs> builders in New York who will kind of, I think just Fake miss their VC. Yeah. They'll kind of misrepresent who's in their community just for the sake of hosting the event. And mm. that's really like, that just doesn't sit right with me. And so, um, I just really focus on like, I would rather do a small event, like pay for the food and the drinks myself and actually have mm. it be valuable. And anytime I uh, like partner with a sponsor, I want the sponsor to feel aligned with what they're doing with me. Like they're right, right, hundred percent right, 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 going right, to get right. the attendees information. They deserve the right to like email the attendees with their product because mm -hmm, they're mm -hmm, sponsoring mm -hmm. the event. So I just think that all of these things compound and it's just different types of community building. I see myself building these professional communities much longer. Like I'm going to be really old <laughs> by the time I maybe stop doing this. So I don't really see it as like the opportunity to just like host parties. Like I really want to focus on content community and actually providing value to people. Hmm. There's a lot of cool stuff that you said to unpack there. One of them being, uh, making sure your 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 sponsors and the people involved in the event aren't just there to like compensate for a lack of finance or resources but that they're genuinely mm -hmm. aligned with the thesis or the mission or the vision or whatever you're trying to do um that's how i think about sponsorship like yes they should get the right to the people's information because these people are looking for something like that sponsor based on who that audience is so then they wouldn't mind getting emailed you know what i'm saying so Huh, so cool. What are the communities you're trying to create right now? Like, uh, what what's your vision for the, the communities you're building? Yeah, so I think that if I'm going to choose an industry, it's going to be consumer. Um, and I know cons there's a lot of, like, controversy about, like, CPG products not really being VC backable and, like, what consumer even means for the VC industry. And so I love VC, or I, I love consumer <laughs> founders as an industry because I love being able to work with like CPG brands who are launching in Sephora and launching in Whole Foods. These are brands that people still need, like even if they're not VC backable, but then also like the consumer tech companies that are going to be the next Instacart or the next Bumble, like these are all consumer as well. So the community that I'm mo most focused on building is just like consumer founders that are around seed to series A stage and just providing them with resources to scale their companies and providing. And when I say resources, I mean both like events with VCs, but also just like Today, I hosted a breakfast with the co-CEO and founder of Higher Dose, and Higher Dose raised $1.2 million and is now almost doing nine figures in revenue. So she barely raised anything and is operating this massive business. So we had this breakfast with 20 consumer founders who got to ask literally any question they wanted to her. So I would say right now I'm really focused on consumer community building, but I also love like, of course I work at a FinTech company. I love thinking about FinTech and making finance and money more accessible to people. So there's a lot of things that I'm interested in, but I will say kind of at its core, it is consumer. And then it is just supporting younger VCs who are kind of new and just starting out their careers as well. How did you get involved in VC at such a young age? Like what was your, so you founded your own stuff and then like, what did you do? Who did you talk to? What? Yeah. So I think part of it kind of like I mentioned was I never really understood what VC was until I was much 
kind of older in my career. Like I know a lot of, I don't want to well, say older because that's kind of misleading. I was just like an upperclassman in college. I know a lot of freshmen and even people who are like 15 who already know what VC is. So that's kind of why it's interesting. But I didn't really know what VC was as a concept. Do you know who Eric Zhu is? Sorry not to cut oh, you yeah, off. Oh, yeah. That, literally who I was thinking of immediately. <laughs> he was the first person I thought of in my head. Um, but Me and him, that's my guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. And so... I think like a huge part of it was I wanted to, I think like, I wanted to help founders. And so I just realized like I had to understand VC if I wanted to help founders. It was almost like I couldn't do one without the other. And so Mm. starting with like founders and working at these startups, that was just kind of like my unintentional path into VC and just meeting more VCs. And then kind of working with Gold House, like I mentioned, especially their ventures arm, I got more involved with them because I loved like their accelerator and they have a community of Asian um, venture capital investors. So a lot of my foray into VC has been rooted in communities that are helping people. So that's kind of how I've like found my way in here. And then I think naturally when you do build really authentic community and you're helping founders, VCs like love that. And so that's kind of, I think how over time, it's really just progressed. But truly, it did just start with like me not really knowing what VC was, but recognizing that I probably should know about it because I was working with all these startups. You've hosted various kinds of events that are uh, not just like people might think there's like panels and net professional networking and parties, but you've done, like you said, breakfasts. You are uh, like taking people on walks. What are some other kinds of event styles that? Like uh, to any aspiring event curators out there, you would tell them like, oh, you could try this or this or this. Yeah. I So kind of to speak to what you said about like the breakfast and like doing pitch and walk, like I, so I don't drink. So I feel like a huge part of oh, nice. all this. Oh, nice. Good for you. <laughs> I feel like a huge... I've done, I've done so much stupid stuff drunk. And if I didn't drink, that would probably save me a lot of... <laughs> strife in my life anyway uh please please continue no honestly like i think that's kind of why i've leaned into doing more of these events because i never really have to consider it and like frankly i didn't know how expensive alcohol can be so i think partly that's why i love doing the morning events because it is a lot easier and people are people sometimes feel more comfortable and I just love doing experience-based events. So for New York Tech Week, I'm, I'm of course, doing kind of some of the larger scale events, but I'm also taking 12 female founders to like a pottery painting class and we're just like painting pottery together. Yeah, so it's like, I like doing simple stuff like that. I've done like a workout class for female founders and investors as well, yeah. How do they talk? (laughs) Um, they don't like, talk during the workout. Everything happens after. <laughs> so okay. some of it is more like you share this experience together and then we like go get brunch or something after or mm. we go get bagels or we go get coffee. And so I think if anyone's starting to do event curation, I think starting with something really cool like that is um, such a good way to build community because people then also love people love like routines and they love like seeing some sim- similar faces like that's what community is. So if you can start something like that, that is repeatable. I feel like that's such a good way to kind of kick things off and keep it going that's interesting and then there's something about sharing an experience together that kind of like uh uh i i was thinking of like three words that maybe would sound weird to describe it but it like adds to the experience so like maybe if if you guys all went through like a navy seals program (laughs) together it'd be really intense and then you'd come out of it and you'd feel like the camaraderie Mm -hmm. yeah i guess not as intense as that but kind of similar similar (laughs) vibes yeah I'm joking. Um, like skydiving, you go skydiving mm-hmm. with with ten founders. Now, now you're getting me to think of ideas because before I was constrained to the idea that, oh, how are you going to talk at a pottery class? That's that's not feasible. How are you going to talk at work? So I would like dismiss those ideas. But you just do that and then you do something else. Mm-hmm. Exactly. That's so cool. Um, what what have been some of the what have been some of the funnest events you've done and like why? Yeah, I think so far some of my and this is such a like counterintuitive I think answer because panels sound really boring, but I have just loved hosting panels. Like I hosted um, Alex Lieberman, the founder of Morning Brew, and I like he of course puts oh, cool. out like so much content. So I just read everything that he had done, and he told me that I was like a great interviewer, and I asked him all these questions that he just hadn't even like 
been asked before and i think that just mm -hmm, goes to mm -hmm. show the level of detail that's a good sign so i loved like hosting him because we got to get so much more out of him than like anything that we find on the internet and that was like of course more of a panel kind of setting but then even like another event that i hosted which is also a panel clearly i like my panels but i do just love being educational and helpful but i hosted a panel about like the fundamentals of just like breaking into vc and the fundamentals of fundraising and that panel was great because there were so many people who came to the panel all. Particularly, there was one girl who came to that panel and she was looking to pivot from being a data scientist to being a venture capitalist. And one of the speakers on the panel worked at Primary Venture Capital and the Venture Capital Fund Primary. And this girl who was in the audience that day ended up becoming one of the first analysts that Primary ever hired. So even though yeah. like these are, I'm talking about panels and not like really fun, like social, like experience stuff, I just love events like that because it, it shows that what I'm doing like has an impact and has value. And I think to me, that's like some of my favorite things to hear about. During the panels, is there's like a play, I personally, sometimes feel trapped in the panel like if i have to watch the panel mm -hmm. so i enjoy there being like an open networking area while the panel's mm -hmm. going on do you do do that yeah so my favorite okay. place to host um my panels is at rise by barclays which um has this really great setup where there's like this open networking area where all the food is and then the there's like doors glass door so you can see through it but it's like a glass wall with a glass door and then the panel room is there so when you're outside you can't hear what's going on inside the panel but there's a tv that projects what's happening in the panel like outside so if you want to go out grab food and like talk to people there's like a huge tv still playing what's happening in the auditorium so i love that format because people can still talk and if they feel like a little antsy and they want to like get up and move around we can do that as well if you could only eat one ethnic cuisine for the rest of your life, what would it be? I mean, I feel like this is kind of an expected answer, but for me, definitely Pakistani food. Uh huh. Yes, most <laughs> people say they're like home food yeah. for sure. Because I mean, like, I would say, like, obviously, like, it would be so nice to have dim sum for the rest of my life. But <laughs> Hong Kong, it's funny because I can eat more dim sum in New York because there's less pork and everything. But in Hong Kong, like, all of dim sum has pork, and I don't eat pork, mm. so it's funny to like have grown up in Hong Kong my whole life, but I can really only eat Hong Kong food when I'm in New York. I find that kind of amusing, yeah. New York has halal dim sum, it's not mm -hmm. a big thing in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> hmm, hmm, hmm. What, um, can you tell me more just about like, what, how you wanna see the VC landscape improve for the better? Uh, how could it be more founder friendly? How could people, uh, yeah, just free ball it for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Kind of the reason that I love Gold House Ventures is the fact that they do have that accelerator. They have a venture arm and they also have just like they've amassed this incredible community of people in media, people in tech, people in VC who are like investors and also founders. And I think the reason their model works so well is because if they have a company in their accelerator that's like a CBG company, they know all the people who are like buyers at like Whole Foods or something. So it almost becomes like this chain reaction where something goes through an accelerator they help them with the next step of their business which is going into retail then the company grows then they can help them with the vc fundraising so it's almost this like chain reaction which i think more vcs need to do or more vcs are going to do where maybe not an accelerator but they have this like expert network of the best like operators to hire or people that you should turn to when it comes to like setting up a bank account or like consultants and so i think right. vcs are starting to realize that community is really at the core of everything which i know like everyone talks about over and over again but i think the reality is there is just so much emphasis on i think like getting the vc check and that kind of being it and now i think a lot of vcs like primary is a great example they have hosted so many um, events for like operators who work at startups because they recognize like these operators who work at startups are the reasons that the startups grow and continue to build so i think vcs like primary and gold house are starting to think more about like building communities that are going to help their portfolio companies whether that is for talent or whether it's for like future fundraising i just feel like more vcs are going in that direction yeah, this is fascinating. Uh, and there's a certain consistency between what you're saying right now, what you said towards the start about mm -hmm. if you're in a room with 90% males and people are going to start thinking the same. And this is very much in alignment with what the intersection has always 
been about. Uh, I'm going to move from this to events. I had tried to start a co-working space when I was like 19 w- with completely bootstrapped. Mm-hmm. Um, and the whole idea was like you could have in here, you know, a health technology founder next to a hip hop producer next to some kind of 3d printing manufacturer next to a streetwear fashion designer and they want to be a part of that environment because if you're a streetwear fashion designer and you want to understand how like this chemical engineer is working on new dyes or uh how they can use new maker tools for their for their work or like material science people and then the material science people if they need a photo shoot or they want to make like an explainer video all like the videographers are over there and so that's kind of like the i'm, I'm going to i have the network i just never had the bandwidth or the resources mm-hmm. but now we have this space so yeah, anyway, this is your interview. Uh, how do you, <laughs> it's like, you see a lot of siloed communities. What, what do you want to see in terms of more like diversity of thought, more like, um, you know, mix of disciplines and industries? Yeah, so I think not to kind of like bring me into the fold or kind of what I've done and focus on. No, you arm. should, this is your interview. <laughs> but I do think that partnering with people like me who like grew up in Hong Kong, <laughs> I'm, I'm Pakistani, I'm a woman, I'm Muslim. Like I just represent so many intersections, kind of like, of course, the name of the podcast. And so I feel like that partnering with people who represent the diversity of thought that you're looking for is such a huge part of it. And the unfortunate reality is like New York is such a diverse city, but for whatever reason, like so many of the community builders in New York are like are first of all men and they're men who don't invite other women and some of them have like 30k on Twitter and they have huge audiences but it's almost like our ecosystem is just slowly starting to disrupt itself and recognize that there are other opinions so I think like partnering with potentially people like me of course I'm, I know there are many others though but just to use myself and as, as an example no you gotta plug yourself as an example really um, go partner with Zephra right now <laughs> but I also just think that like Part of it is also just focusing really intentionally on the community that you want to build. So like in hindsight, if I could go back in time and tell myself, it maybe makes more sense to focus on one community very specifically before just doing a bunch of things. I think I would have saved myself like a lot of energy and time spent on stuff that maybe didn't actually pan out. So I think starting really specific is super, super helpful because it's going to get you to that point where you'll see what works and then you'll iterate and you build for one community that's so involved versus trying to do everything and I think a lot of young people have a tendency to like want to try everything like I certainly did and I still do but like reining yourself in and focusing on that specificity is going to allow you to partner with other people who need that specificity and they need that diversity of thought hmm well then what's what's the balance of like trying to capture that that diversity of thought and disciplines while still being specific and focused and not too scatterbrained? I think it's like, so the, what I'm thinking of in my head is kind of like what my priorities are. And when you ask me like, what communities do I care the most about? Like now I can really safely say like consumer founder and consumer investors, and then just helping VC analysts through like principles get their career progression, understand what the future of their career looks like. But had you asked me this question like three months ago, I would have said like FinTech communities, Series A founders, AI, like crypto, and I would have said mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. 20 different things. And so I think even even though it's not that specific to say like consumer founders and consumer investors, I do think that starting there that's still pretty broad. So you can still do and you can still do and try a lot within it and eventually you're going to see what makes sense and what resonates with people and what's going to stick and what's going to last. So when I say like specificity, it's it's specific enough to give yourself wiggle room to try a lot of things, but then sp- also specific enough to where you're not trying to do like too much, which is like mm-hmm, kind of mm-hmm. difficult, but I always say start yourself with an industry and then choose a stage and then just figure out like all the types of content and community building that you want to do just within that intersection. Anything you want to plug any, any last words of, of wisdom, any kind of vision that you want to put out into the world or anything at all. The, the floor is yours. 
Honestly, I think that kind of just speaking to the future of the Z-List, a lot of people ask me what I think I'm going to do in the future, and part of me always wants to say I don't know. But the one thing I do know is that what I've built with the Z-List is a community and content platform that's dedicated to making the founder experience easier, and I know I'm going to be doing that for the rest of my career. So if you want to follow along on what I'm doing, of course, you can um, really just check me out on Twitter. It's just my name with an underscore, and you can see all the things that I'm doing there. But I know I'm going to be doing this for the rest of my career, and it's going to be a huge part of my professional development. It's already been a huge part of my personal development. So um, no, thank you so much for having me on and hope I was helpful. Super helpful. Thanks for joining me. Mm -hmm.